Yeah, you'll have to. Okay, I'll admit. Okay, all right. Thanks, Steve. Okay. Um, sorry, folks. We had a snafu. We had the thing was blocking somebody else from taking over, so we'll have to figure that out. Um, it's uh, Ashley and Leela. Are you and Sam? You guys are all here. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, Ashley, here. you're here. I haven't. Heard I'm here as well. Okay. Good. So. Darby, I think um, Gretchen's going to give you host, and then during the lunch panel, you and I offline will make sure that it works. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I don't know what happened because it worked when I tested it. Did it asked you for a phone number or anything? No, it didn't. It just huh. kept giving me the message that the host would have to let me in. Okay. And then I think Gretchen can leave and you stay the host, if that's yeah, okay. Yeah, that should work. Yeah, hey, I just made you host, so you should be all set. Will you, can you confirm you can admit people and stuff? Yep, I got it. Okay. Awesome. See you later. Thanks, Gretchen. My, no problem. Okay, we're only three minutes late. That means you guys have permission to go three minutes into the break. That's why we have 10 minute spaces. So nobody panic. We're all good, right? <laughs> Am I in, Sharon? Yes, yeah, you Sharon, are. You're in, you're in. Okay, so Sharon, now I see Lila. Okay. Okay, Sharon. Okay, you want me to start now? You can go I, ahead I and can't start. talk who's here, but okay. I am going to officially start as chair. Thank you, Steve and Darby. Um, I'm Sharon Kane, and I teach at the State University of New York at Oswego, where I teach courses in young adult literature and a course in new adult literature, among other things. Ashley, Leela, and Tom are going to introduce themselves briefly as they begin presenting. Um, my job is to remind you that this is being recorded. Um, please keep yourselves muted. And um, I will ask your tech questions to the host. Um, I'll be the timekeeper. So after 20 minutes, I will um, switch things and make the transition. And we'll have the last few minutes for questions and answers. So put your questions in the chat, please. So I will turn it over to Ashley. Sure. Well, thank you, Sharon. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with everyone. Can you guys see that? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Ashley Black. I'm an assistant professor yeah. of great. Uh, English education at Northwest Missouri State University. So I, I do teach courses in young adult literature. I also teach courses in, in literacy, grammar, just basically all of our <laughs> um, English pedagogy courses. But what I'm gonna be talking with you guys about today is um, my latest young adult lit course in which I restructured it um, to incorporate engaging young adult literature um, for racial literacy development. So when I'm thinking about engaging that word there, I'm thinking of it in the adjectival form, right? So thinking about young adult lit that is engaging for this racial literacy development and the act of engaging it itself as readers. So I wanted to give a little bit of a presentation overview. So I'll be giving a little bit of information about the theoretical framework that's that informs the work that I've been doing. Um, then I'm gonna be talking with you uh, quite a bit about the Young Adult Lit course, the context of where I teach, what we did in the course, and then maybe some recommendations for things that you could be doing with your students in your own classroom. So firstly, um, the theoretical framework that is informing this work is based out of critical whiteness studies and racial literacy. So when I'm talking about critical whiteness studies, I'm thinking about the ways that we, you know, have possibly in our own university training, we're taught about, you know, multicultural education or culturally responsive teaching. But critical whiteness studies is asking us to go a step further, especially um, for white teachers to really critically engage what it means to be white, how do we construct whiteness in our world? How do we reproduce whiteness? And how do we um, kind of take stock of the way that it informs 
basically systems in our society, right? So we can dismantle those prejudices and um, different levels of oppression. So in an article that he wrote, Tanner talks about critical whiteness studies um, as a challenge for white teachers. And these are the things that he challenges us to do. He asks us to stop looking um, to people of color to shoulder the burden of anti-racism work. He asks us to investigate whiteness independently of what it means to be a person of color. So again, what, is it, what does it mean to be white? What does it mean for me and my own racial identity to be a white woman? Um, and he also talks about reflecting on whiteness as, a, as something that we need to do repeatedly, right, in all situations, because of course we know that we can, we all have our own internalized biases that can creep up in different circumstances. Um, so he's wanting us to, to continue to look at that. And then thinking of racial literacy development, what does that mean? Um, so yes, it's that we want to help our students develop a racialized literacy and that they can they understand um, these different facets of race and identity. Um, but when we're thinking about combining that with literacy, it really wants us to disrupt these traditional types of pedagogy in order to recenter um, anti-racist frameworks, right? So it recognizes that racism is an endemic problem. Um, it helps us to challenge these colorblindness theories that, um, that we see in literature and of course in the world. Um, certainly values the voices and experiences of people of color. And again, we see this repeated to interrogate this conceptualization of, of whiteness. So one thing, one of the books that kind of got me really interested, I'm gonna hold it up and it's on my references page, <laughs> is this book by um, Borshan Black and help me, <laughs> Sarin Ganigas. Um, on letting go of literary whiteness, um, anti-racist literature for for white students, and one of the this quotation just really stuck out to me, um, where they talked about this personal work is imperative for helping students challenge deeply held assumptions um, and develop healthy racial identities. And the journey of self-discovery will take a lifetime of committed effort for all white students. Um, so speaking of white students, <laughs> the university in where I teach, Northwest Missouri State, is a regional university. Our, we serve about 7,300 students total. Um, 2,000 of those are graduate students. Of all of the students that we have, you can see that we've got about 4% are international students, 12% are domestic students of color. So it is a a majority you know, of our students are white. Um, in 2016, in response to a lot of, well, all the things that we've seen in the news, right? Our university instituted an Office of Diversity Inclusion in 2016. And so since that time, um, diversity and inclusion has been something that has been much more visible on this campus. Um, so that's kind of interesting to know in my particular Y course from this past spring, I had 14 students total. Two of those students were students of color. Um, the remaining 12 were white. I had 13 females, one male. Um, 10 of the 14 are, were enrolled in teacher preparation programs. Um, the other three were graduate students, or other four rather, I'm sorry. Um, so of course the, here comes one of my students now. <laughs> And so the population of my class, of course, largely is representative of white, white female, right, students. Um, as for myself, I position myself as someone who's committed to anti-racist pedagogies. Um, I was raised in the Southeastern United States, if you haven't picked on that from my accent. Um, and I do identify as a white middle-class able-bodied married um, cis woman. So let's get into talking about my course. Um, one of the things that letting go of literary whiteness 
and the authors talk about is incorporating racialized literary objectives into the, your student learning outcomes. So as opposed to just thinking about teaching students about race through literature, I mean, that is certainly something that we do, but it's actually incorporating racialized objectives in, into your courses. So for example, I've included a few of these here. Um, develop a racial literacy awareness was something that I wanted my students to do. I wanted my students to increase their capacity to think critically, historically, and intersectionally about social justice, social identities and structures of power, privilege, and oppression. And then at the end, think about explore YA fiction from the perspective of these different, um, these different lenses. I've included here the, the text that I chose for instruction. And when I was selecting the texts, um, I really wanted to make sure that I was centering authors of color um, in my class. There are a couple of exceptions here and I chose them kind of purposefully. Um, to Kill a Mockingbird comes up here, of course, because as we know, it's one of the most commonly taught texts in secondary schools. Um, I also decided to include uh, Dig by A.S. King. Um, I'll kind of talk about that towards the end in just a second about how I try to set up To Kill a Mockingbird and Dig as almost um, two sides of the same coin, right? They're both white, um, white authors. They both um, are texts that address the is issues of race, but they do it in very different ways. <clears throat> okay. So in terms of course assignments that I use to engage my students in this type of work, um, based off of that text, Letting Go of Literary Whiteness, um, the very beginning of our course, we, we read Stamped, right, by Kibram Indy and Jason Reynolds to use as some background information for students. And we used that, let's see if I can. Can everyone see the Google Doc? Or is it, no, it's still the PowerPoint. Okay, let me do a new share. I'm so sorry. Okay, here we go. So this is the sample of the, the course glossary that we actually put together. Um, so what we did is we started looking for key terms, right, as we read stamped. Um, I asked students to write their own definitions. I'll talk about this remixed definition in just a second. We did this based off of, um, I think the long way down. We kind of use that as inspiration. And then I asked them to do a multimodal representation and then any kind of bibliographic citations, right, for any of the course readings that we, that we read. So we used this as kind of our baseline for having conversations. At the beginning of the term, I asked students how comfortable um, they were in talking about issues of race. A lot of them did kind of self-identify self as being someone who is anti-racist, but didn't necessarily find it very comfortable to talk about race or they hadn't talked about it a lot in public settings, right? So I wanted to make sure that we were all on kind of the same page with terms. Um, before every, every book that we read, I asked them to complete a racialized, um, reader response journal and I'll give you guys kind of a shot of what that looks like. Um, again, this is also from um, Letting Go of Literary Whiteness. One thing that I really liked about this kind of reader response type of journal is that on the left hand side you can see in the, um, I don't know what kind of color that is, that marigold color we might say. Um, this is definitely like the formalist kind of side of things, a traditional literary analysis. And then the reader questions, this is where it's kind of asking students to think about their own racial identity and how that possibly informs their reading of a text. So for me as their, their professor, <coughs> the right-hand side of their charts were always way more interesting to me. I wanted to see over the course of the, of the term, you know, how their responses changed. Um, so thinking about how the text positions you, does it position you as a racial insider or outsider? That's something I've, 
I found that my students needed a little bit of help navigating towards the beginning of the term. By the end of the term, most of them had a little bit of a better grasp. Um, <clears throat> I will say for a lot of my white students, which of course most of them were white, um, <clears throat> I think they had they had a difficult time translating, like they understood their own racial identities, but they had a difficult time translating that into how that influences the way that they're reading. Um, <clears throat> that they're reading these texts. Um, okay. So the other kind of assignments that I also use with students, I'm sorry for going back and forth um, so much, but um, students also put together a text set in, a, in small groups. I asked them to kind of take maybe one idea from the class and read additional books, right, and put them together. So for example, I had a group who looked at the intersectionality of being um, a queer person of color and how that was represented in YA fiction. <coughs> Students also wrote an exploratory essay in which they examined their own racial identity they evaluated a race-based incident, and then they also selected one of the texts that we read for class. Um, through a critical race theory lens. And then lastly, they did a multi-genre paper, literary analysis through um, a racialized lens as well. Okay, so I wanted to highlight a couple of the books that I felt like kind of really went well together in the couple of minutes I have left. Um, <clears throat> if you haven't read Dig, I know a lot of us probably have. I will mm -hmm. say out of all of the books, that was the one personally that I can't stop thinking about just in general. I think it's such a rich, rich and complex text. Um, but we started the term with To Kill a Mockingbird and we ended with Dig, right? So thinking mm -hmm. about how they're both about race um, but they approach race in, in very different ways, right? So um, that was really interesting with my students. We also looked at Monster. I mean, that's one of those kind of classic texts. Um, and we read that directly after To Kill a Mockingbird. Again, looking at incarceration, right? Um, mm. Looking at Dare Martin. Um, yeah. So in terms of some recommendations for practice that I have, um, one, again, just kind of going back to those theoretical frameworks, I would suggest, and for me, the first place I started was going back to look at my own text that I choose for instruction, looking at how, how much am I including voices of color in terms of authors and in, in terms of authentic experiences. Am I including texts that are just stock stories, right? Or am I including counter stories in my, um, in my classroom? Um, also looking at, you know, white authors, like for example, To Kill a Mockingbird, going back to it and kind of reevaluating it and really looking at whiteness as opposed to looking at um, the experiences of race. Like what is it that the white, the white characters are doing, how do they exhibit power um, and whatnot. And then let's see, I believe that might be, that might be all that I have. There are the references. I mean, I, for me personally, I cannot recommend letting go of literary whiteness enough. It was such an excellent read. Um, so that's the end of my, my portion. And I know that we'll come back for questions at the end. And it looks like Sharon. Bella and Tom. Oh, and, you're back. Oh, good. Okay. Then thank you, Ashley. We're turning it over to Lelia and Lila and Tom. All right, guys. I am going to share my screen right away. Um, And I 
if I could get to my PowerPoint presentation, that would be awesome. <laughs> For some reason, it is covered with that. Um, okay, I think. All right, here we are. Sorry, guys. Um, good morning to the ones who are on the West Coast and good afternoon to everyone else. I'm Lilia Petrie and I'm from Southeastern Louisiana University. I present today with my outstanding undergraduate student, Sam, and I will let Sam to introduce himself. So greetings to all of you guys, um, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, I'm an undergraduate student at Southeastern Louisiana University. I play on the men's golf team and I'm a double major in finance and English literature and language. Um, in addition to all of that, I'm also aspiring to be a Rhodes Scholar. Thank you, Sam. The title of our presentation today, even when we hurt, we find hope, rediscovering strength, love and joy with young adult literary characters. And uh, I firmly believe this title can be applied to any young adult novel that we read. Uh, today, we are just going to uh, briefly talk through three um, young adult novels. And thank you to Ashley kind of leading us towards Dear Martin, because this is the first novel I'd like to uh, briefly introduce. In this novel, a uh, 17 year old high school senior, uh, Justice McAllister, who has always been a good kid in his own understanding and understanding of those surrounding him, gets in trouble with police and gets arrested, uh, trying to help out um, his ex girlfriend to get safely home. Um, he um, from this moment, he's deeply scarred and trying to understand whether the outcome of this incident would be different if he had a different um, uh, color of his skin. So he begins the Dear Martin project with the hope to find answers to the question, what would Martin do? Because for him, Martin is an exemplary um, person who knows or seemingly knows how to deal with uh, issues of right, racial injustice. Um, justice is hurt, he is angry, he wants to get the answers, he, and he just can't uh, come to uh, understanding how all these things with police brutality are happening throughout the um, country. By the end of the novel, he realizes that his important question should shift from who would Martin, um, what would Martin do to who would Martin be? Meaning that first of all, he has to understand who he is to accept himself. So here is uh, the um, hope for justice. He wants to take time to understand what's going on around him, what is his place in this society, and only after that to make informed decisions and um, act. Uh, we are moving on to our next novel, Sam. So I've Lost My Way by Gail Foreman um, is a young adult novel that really portrays how loss can help to rediscover what it means to experience love. The storyline basically entangles three young characters in the midst of New York City. Um, Freya, who is a young singer who's on the verge of losing what she really believes is her identity, um, but at the same time, her relationship with her family is also crumbling. Haroon is lost between the expectations of his family, religion, and culture, but also his sexuality. And then we have Nathaniel, who has found his way to New York but has nothing behind him and nothing really in front of him either. These characters find themselves in a newfound friendship after Freya falls off of a bridge onto Nathaniel. Meanwhile, Haroon witnesses it all. The adventures that they encounter throughout the novel uh, really bring them closer to each other's friends, but it brings them really close to coping with their individual losses that ultimately re results 
in them finding love, not only for each other, but also for the future. Thank you. Sam and then Navinovo, could you please talk through this one? And then Love, Hate, and Other Filters by Samira Ahmed is also very similar. Um, we have Maya Aziz, um, who is a young woman with a really bright future. It details how she embraces her identity and how that's the catalyst for hope and joy. Her parents believe that she'll be attending the University of Chicago to pursue a professional degree program, but that really is much different from her actual dreams. Her true desire lies in attending NYU to be a filmmaker. But amongst all of this turmoil, she's also conflicted with her love life because her feelings don't really correspond with the expectations of her family or her culture either. At the same time, Maya finds herself ready to embrace all of these challenges and emotions only to be set back by a terrorist attack that leaves her targeted in her public and community and at school. This instance transforms her path and she realizes that she will probably have to fracture her past and present in order to embrace and truly find the joyfulness in her future that she desires. Thank you, Sam. So all these novels, if you can um, see if you read those, um, they deal with pain, with loss, with tragedy. And because we all need healing and our students in the classrooms, whether they are adolescents in secondary English classroom or whether they are our undergraduate students need this connection to literary characters to get through. Uh, we are offering a couple of activities as post-reading enrichment activities. The first one I call picking up the pieces activity. has been, um, detailed in uh, my chapter, uh, Teaching the Taboo, um, that was edited by Victor Malivera and Paula Greathouse. If you don't know, this is a great book for school teachers and librarians. So in this activity, uh, we divide class in groups of three or four students. The teacher will prepare the envelope for each group. And what I do, I take the image that represents the novel. So if it's Dear Martin, it can be a police car because this was the accident. If it is uh, Love, Hate and other filters, the image can be uh, the Canon professional camera, which represents your hobby and the outlook in the world. If um, we are considering I have lost my way, we could take an image of that uh, little um, overpass bridge from which prayer fell on top of Nathaniel and uh, show how this little bridge have connected all three of them. So I cut up this into seven to nine pieces, uh, if possible, depending on how many people you have and how large your image can be. Uh, I use the standard copy paper, but um, if you want, you can turn it in a full poster paper project. So I, I am instructing students to complete the image by putting the pieces together. Uh, as they look through it, I also ask them to think about the novel one more time and maybe pay a little bit attention to close reading, find one or two quotes from a novel that reveal pain of tragedy or loss, the struggle that adolescents are going uh, through at the moment. And then they may also choose one or two quotes that give them a glimpse of hope. Um, I also ask them to write four or five tools for healing or coping. What do they do when they fail? What do they do when they experience loss? how do they pick up themselves and uh, move on? I want them to think what helps them move on. Uh, at the end of the project, each group presents their final image already combined, compiled and explain the quotes and their coping tools. I have two examples right here. One of my favorite images is the broken heart. This was a small paper size, so I only cut it into five pieces. But if you can see, there is the tragedy quote right here. 
the hopeful quote with the page numbers, and then what students think would be best ways to cope uh, with the tragedy. There is another one. This one we completed when we read Heat List by Jennifer Brown. It's about the school shooting because of bullying. Um, this one is cut into seven pieces. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six pieces actually. Um, and uh, also here's a hopeful upside down quote. And then the one that uh, is about the tragedy and a couple of coping. Um, uh, tools. Um, I think exercises like this help us to connect what we read with our uh, real life experiences. Uh, another activity we want to talk about is a tree of hope. I'll let Sam to introduce this activity and then we'll see if we have time to actually complete it, um, at least start completing it. So like Dr. Petrie was alluding to, um, a Tree of Hope activity is great for an individual basis, for small groups, or even in a classroom. And it really helps relate students not only to their own lives, but also to the text that we're reading in classes. Um, so it's pretty simple. Um, we, you would have your students discuss the main characters or struggles, um, their challenges, and the ways that they come to understand themselves through coping with this from the books. Um, if they haven't read the books, then we would simply do it um, in a way that would relate it to their own lives. Um, and then we would have these students write a sentence or two, um, just generally about the character's dreams or hopes for the future, or even in their own lives. And then we can share this in, as the whole class or in groups. And we can additionally use this to write haikus, which we'll see in the next slide. Yeah. Uh so we ask our students to look back at the sentences and try to put them in a haiku form. Here in the classroom, you may have a little bit more time than we in this presentation. So you may teach them how to write haiku step by step. Um, or if they are already familiar, just remind them the structure of the haiku and ask them that um, to create three lines you may explain that the lines can be related as part part to whole of a concept, idea, or subject, or um, from whole to parts. Uh, it can be worth describing a concept, idea, and maybe some even final statement. Or any actually form of sequence and phrasing will work because the main idea is to make students think about this thing. Um, uh, for example, we looked at our novels uh, in I Have Lost My Way, Helping One Another, Frey, Nathaniel, and Ferran. They saved actually themselves from pain and despair because at some point they understood that someone else's pain is more important. And giving that mercy to someone else and providing grace actually is more rewarding than just worrying about. As a result, we had this beautiful haiku, regifted mercy, home for all who claim it. Let love teach us how. Um, as I already talked through dear Martin, it's at the end of the novel, he realizes that the main question should be about personality, understanding himself and accepting. So haiku for this one, Hope for justice means understanding who he is. Acceptance first. After accepting uh, himself, we can move over. Uh, at the end, what we do, we ask students to write their haiku on a cut out templates. Uh, and then we attach the leaves with haikus to the tree on a post. In the classroom, it's pretty easy. Uh, post a size paper. You may also ask students, like Sam said before, think about their personal dreams, hopes, their struggles, and how they come to term. I also like, if you see on this tree, our leaves are of different color. And on this one, uh, also a kind of symbolic representation of our diversity. We are different people, we think differently, we write differently, and we want to be uh, kind of differentiated from each other in, in terms of recognizing our uniqueness and individuality. So let's try 
to write this together um, Sam, um, help people to start um, writing the haikus. I think we have a few minutes. Okay, so um, as we said, um, our three books, um, Dear Martin, um, I've Lost My Way, and Love, Hate, and Other Filters. Um, if you've read any of these books, um, we would love for you guys to write a simple haiku and type in the chat. Uh, but even if you haven't read these books, um, a haiku about any um, current young adult novel or something in your own life would be more than relevant. Um, and we'd really appreciate you guys to um, think about it for a minute, type it in the chat, and we'll construct it into a way um, that can be used for students um, for distance learning when the opportunity for you know a paper format isn't really applicable. Thank you so much. So I am going to stop sharing right here. You do guys remember 575, think about struggles, either characters or your personal, think about your students. Okay, try to jot down something and I will show how to compile that digitally. Okay, I do not see any uh, written haikus yet, but let me share um, their online tool that can be used. And uh, if I could go to a new share. Okay, um, I'll probably need to um, get out of the presentation mode uh, first. Just a minute, guys. Um, okay, big score. So what I found online, if you have, um, can you see my screen now? If you have uh, a coral draw, Photoshop, you can very well use um, it for the purpose of this assignment online. I have found this um, PixArt editor very helpful and it works really well um, with any image that you want. It doesn't have to be a tree of hope. It can be a mosaic of hope. It can be flowers of hope and butterflies of hope. The idea is to um, work and compile different thoughts in a haiku form. So what I did initially, I clicked to the left of the screen on photos, went to my photos, and you see that upload button over here. I uploaded the tree template. I'm going to delete it because I already have uploaded. And then I wanted some leaves on the tree. So I went to stickers and I typed leaves and I clicked enter and you can scroll down and choose any leaf you want and somewhere over here, there is a leaf that I have chosen. It's right here, okay? So when I click on it, it appears immediately and you can work with it. You can minimize its size. You can turn it around any way you want. And you can move it up, attach to any branch and so on. Right now, what I have done here, guys, I clicked on the text tab to my left. And when you are clicking on it, it says add a body text right here. So 
what we could do right now. Do we have any uh, high Christian? Can you check the chat? Um, I don't think anyone has gotten to it yet, which is okay. Um, we have some sample ones. Okay, so um, let's see if I can pull out yeah. one of mine. I don't know which one I have. Yeah, maybe share one and then we will go to questions and conversation. Yes, yes. So guys, this was the idea of how to create it. Uh, and we can now go to the conversations. Thank you so much, Sam. And thank you everyone for joining this session. I am, Hi. I stop sharing. Yeah, um, patients work very well together. Um, when you were talking about the books and when you were talking about the student reactions, um, it seemed like the common theme was that of identity, that young people have to understand themselves in order to really understand others. And it kind of works both ways. Um, so having said that, um, I would like to, I didn't see any questions yet in the chat. So, um, but one thing that you could do is everybody, all the participants, if you're thinking of particular books that would work well with any of the strategies or ideas that were brought up in either presentation, um, if you put them in the chat, I think that the presenters would really help that, help, would really appreciate that. Um, so does anyone have any question? You can write it in the chat or you can just say it. And if not, I'd like to turn it back for a minute to Ashley. Having heard the second presentation, do you wanna make any connections or respond? Oh, sure. And I, I think there were some really helpful comments going on in the chat too about um, being mindful of including positivity, right? So I don't, you know, that's certainly something I think that is very much important and something that we we did focus on and came out in our in our class discussions. Um, I think the crossover is a great example of a book that that offers some of that for you know for students and possibilities, um, but that's definitely something I'm going to be keeping in mind uh, moving forward. Yeah. I the other participants want to ask a question. Ashley, I wondered if you and you. Oh, go ahead, Leila. I see a question from Joe Knowles that asks, do you consider student privacy when doing this activity? I often worry when I do school visits how much I ask of students to share. Um, I always uh, am considering those issues in my classroom. When they come, first of all, the first couple of weeks, we are building that safe environment. We are building trust relationship. And, uh, uh, we talk about uh, how we truly have to be open-minded in this classroom. And open-mindedness means that we do not just accept our own opinions, but we listen to different ones respectfully. I also, when I ask them to complete any assignment, any journal, any sharing activity, I also say, keep in mind we are going to share. So please share only what you feel comfortable to share. And you'd be surprised how much they are willing to share. <laughs> Sometimes I don't want them to share. Them. <laughs> and they do. So we are always, I, I think we are all intuitively um, trained to do this. Or um, Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, several people I think have asked in both presentations where can they get the wonderful resources that you showed on your slides? Will you be sharing your PowerPoints or resources? I can actually add the link into the program if necessary. Okay. Um, 
or we will probably ask the host because I do not have the editing privileges on that document. I did email my PowerPoint yesterday to Sarah Donovan. So they have it, we can share. Our email addresses are at the PowerPoint, on the PowerPoint if you uh, want. Um, all my young adult class is project-based. So I have activity for every novel if you want to. And also follow Dr. Bickmer's YA Wednesdays because occasionally I write in the blog in, and I promise that um, in the next one, I will share for as many projects as I can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How about you, Ashley? Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I did put a link to the Google Doc for the Racialized Reader Response Journal um, in the chat. Um, I'm happy to, to share my PowerPoint or any other resources. I'll put my email in the chat as well um, in case anyone would like to, to request any of those. I'm happy to share any ma materials as well. Um, yeah. And I believe for those of you asking the questions about this, I believe the uh, preferred method is to share the materials during the presentation if you're able to, because um, I know we're not linking them in the program like we did last year. Okay. Thanks, Darby. Ashley, I wondered if you and your students had watched, um, after reading Dig, if you watched A.S. King's Prince Award speech. We did. Um, I found that very powerful. Yes, very much so too. And I really enjoyed too um, sharing with them Elizabeth Acevedo speaking. I mean, if there is anyone that I think I could just sit and listen to read poetry all day long, it might be her. Yeah, they really enjoyed that. Anyone else? Final words, Sam? I just wanted to thank you guys so much for giving us the opportunity to present. Um, I'm not sure if students usually get to present in this, um, but I know it's definitely an experience that I've enjoyed um, and that I'm very grateful for, um, especially to um, have been able to learn under Dr. Petrie. Um, her information and knowledge is certainly invaluable in any endeavor that I would choose to do. I think that is, oh, okay, go, I was going to say that that was a wonderful voice to end with, but Lila wants to answer that, so go ahead, Lila. Uh, no, you are welcome to end. I just wanted to say thank you to Sam and mention that very seldom I bring undergraduate students to conferences. More likely it's the graduate students, so that's my second experience of bringing in an undergraduate and Sam is early in the program. The course he took with me is just introduction to literary analysis. So he's done an awesome job. So it's 2.20. Thank you to, for everyone joining us and have a great day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. This is all, uh, we are, the next thing we have is back in the main room. Okay. Thank you. Are we just leaving, Sharon, or? Yes, I believe we are. I will end the session. Okay. Good seeing you, Leela. Nice seeing you too. <laughs> I hope we'll see each other some more.